Welcome aboard the Shipshape Podcast, your ultimate destination for marine wisdom and expertise. Our skilled crew, comprised of top boating journalists and experts, is committed to delivering informative and captivating content week after week. We're eager to connect with and learn from our fellow mariners, and we encourage you to share our podcast with your friends. Remember, word of mouth is our lifeblood, and if you enjoy an episode, please leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. By doing so, you're helping us forge a robust community of mariners who can learn, collaborate, and exchange their experiences out on the water. Today on the Shipshape Podcast, we have Danny Badger, currently serving as the Marine Extension Specialist with the MIT Sea Grant College Programme. He brings to our discussion over a decade of experience from the New England Aquarium and noteworthy roles with leading environmental organizations. A champion of sustainable and resilient communities, Danny's influence stretches from local initiatives to national conversations on climate change. So let's give a warm welcome to our guest, Danny Badger. Your host today are Georgia Tyndale, that's me. I'm a freelance writer and editor in the maritime and yachting sphere, and I'm based in Lancaster in the UK. And I'm Merrill. I'm a liveaboard on a Toshing Toshiba 36 in Boston, Massachusetts. So, Danny, where are you coming to us from? I am currently at my home in Chelmsford, Massachusetts. And, uh, you know, it's quite a heat wave that we've been in for a while, hasn't it? Oh, yeah. One of the beauties of working from home, you can step outside, sweat for five seconds and run back inside into the AC. Though in my role, I'm working with a lot of aquaculture growers who (laughs) don't have that luxury. And so it's always a good reminder and rude awakening every time I'm out in the field with them. Put it in eight hours, 10 hours on a 95 degree day with no shade. It's a lot of fun. So before we kick off for the uninitiated and i would class myself as part of that group please could you just give us an idiot's definition of what aquaculture is (laughs) and there are some robust discussions about how to define that sometimes okay Uh, here we go (laughs) the simplest terms is it's farming in the ocean or farming of aquatic species so aquaculture can happen on land in freshwater systems but it's really agriculture with water-based organisms, whether they be animal or plant, or some can do bacteria. But really it's around here. Most people in Massachusetts who are doing aquaculture are doing shellfish aquaculture. So they're raising oysters. And it's a pretty big process, getting them to spawn in in a hatchery setting, getting them out to out in the ocean and growing to size. It takes two to three years to get up to market size so that they can be wonderful cup of oyster goodness that people often enjoy at half shell markets or raw bar markets but it can also be raising fin fish a lot of the salmon that we eat in this country are uh, grown through aquaculture in mostly internationally but some some in the states so what is it you exactly do day to day within the sphere no one knows uh, it's <laughs> it's very it, it ranges quite a bit so the Sea Grant program is a federal college partnership that is an extension operation. We really are aiming to be the bridge between research and regulators and practitioners and passionate individuals to ensure that we utilize our coastal resources in the most informed and wise way forward while supporting those communities that are really reliant on, on these coastal resources. My role is specifically to support aquaculture in Massachusetts, and I'm through MIT Sea Grant. Uh, Massachusetts has two Sea Grant programs where only the only other company that we have there is California has two. Every other coastal state has one program. Uh, it's a weird fluke of history that we have two. But one of the things that we, where my role really is to play is I work closely with growers to get an idea of what their challenges are, and I bring those challenges back to many of the big brains that are going to school at MIT or leading the next generation through research and instruction at MIT and our partner institutions to see how do they how do they tackle these? How could they design some sort of solution that can try to make that aquaculture operation more sustainable and more cost effective? When we say sustainable, I'm certainly not saying just 
for the environment, though that is the, one of the, if not the leading uh, driver, but it's also for economic sustainability, um, cultural and community sustainability. And so my day-to-day, it, I have several projects that I'm, I've kind of decided are through it, through consultation with a lot of uh, some a steering committee of growers and researchers and regulators, the areas that I spend my time with are looking at how do we develop a better workforce for an industry that often struggles to find steady workers who will come back year to year. It's not a massively lucrative career, especially when you're talking about farmhands. The owners of some farms can make a fair bit of money, but it really is there's a huge capital investment that goes into establishing a farm. There's a huge time commitment that goes into it and bureaucratic commitment that goes into it. What I'm aiming to figure out is how do we get those people who are who don't have that capital investment, get them into the industry, see that as an, a career opportunity, and perhaps build up to that opportunity to run their, their own farms. We have a, an aging population of workers and farm owners. We also are facing a number of other challenges we run into with aquaculture. One of the big ones being the NIMBY effect, or not in my backyard. A lot of coastal communities struggle to fi- define, you know, is do we really want to have this kind of blue collar-esque feel to our coastline? And uh, there are many communities that recognize that as a romantic and beautiful image of somebody working some low profile farms and making a very honest living. There are other communities who really value, they prioritize having their viewscape to themselves. And that can be a big challenge. And one of the roles that Sea Grant can play is be a broker between those, those interested parties to really get to the heart of the matter of how could we get these groups working together. So I'm working a bit on some outreach to engage some of these groups that are diametrically opposed and see some common ground. We also look at challenges such potential disasters. One project we're working on right now is with the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. They have a a shellfish farm that we want to get them prepared to deal with the eventuality of an oil spill. If there was a big oil spill around here, What do we do for growers? And it has become clear that the nationwide responders to oil spills don't have a great idea of what aquaculture is. As you say, you know, a lot of people don't really understand it um, or not familiar familiar with it. They don't incorporate it into their training. You know, as we respond to this this oil spill, we have to think about all these priorities for the for the community. What do we need to protect? We need to get aquaculture in there as one of those major priorities. It's a it's a major resource for these communities that if an oil spill came along and, and wiped out operations, it can impact that community's future for, for quite a while. So Danny, what, what would we do? One of the big pieces is provide a little bit of training for growers themselves, as well as getting the first responders to recognize, oh, there are farms here and there and there. And if there is an event, we need to communicate. We need to get them into our communication tr- network so that they know what's going on. They can protect their own resources. Maybe if we can say there's a slick going towards your farm, some growers can get their product out of the water just in time. Depending on the type of spill, some growers may be able to sink their product. So a lot of times shellfish is growing in floating bags. And if you, yeah. one of the, the strategies to deal with the winter and potential icing events, potential icebergs that come through is sink your product down to the bottom, get it out of harm's way. Potentially a grower could get out there and do that for much of their operation uh, yeah. if they had enough heads up. It doesn't have to exactly. be that there's an oil spill and therefore you have to write everything off. That's really in, that's really interesting. And really, Meryl, I don't know how you feel, but I find hearing this level of detail so interesting because it's wow. just, if you don't work in this specific field, you absolutely have no idea, but it's absolutely fascinating to hear like, if there's an right. oil spill, what are you actually going to do on like a practical level? It's fascinating. Thank you. Well, he's certainly in the education side of the industry as well. So, you know, before we continue on and start asking some more kind of hot topic questions, how exactly did you end up in aquaculture to begin with? So I cut my teeth for about 14, 15 years at the New England Aquarium after I got my undergraduate at University of Washington in fisheries science. 
And that's really just how do you manage fisheries without screwing them over and without screwing over all the people whose livelihoods depend on those fisheries. I got my master's at University of New Hampshire on uh, natural resources and again, looking at management. And while there, I started volunteering at the New England Aquarium. This piece I want to say to teenagers who are thinking that they might want to go down this route. When I was in high school, I always wanted to volunteer at the aquarium. Um, I was out in, in Washington State, so I wanted to volunteer at the Seattle Aquarium. And I always assumed I knew nothing. I did not know enough to step in my toe in the door and, and pretend to know stuff. I was in college and I still thought the same thing. Got to grad school, I'm like, okay, I'm almost a little way through my master's. I could probably do some work down there. And so I volunteered, started working on the floor of the aquarium in Boston, the New England Aquarium. And I at first started doing some food prep for the giant ocean tanks, so cutting up fish and doing surface feeds, just throwing them out onto the surface of the water and, uh, for some specific species and feeding myrtle, the big green sea turtle. That was always fun. But my boss quickly noticed that while most people who were in food prep would get out there, feed all the food they can, and then run away as fast as possible because they, when you're inundated by a ton of visitors asking a ton of questions, that's not always the most comfortable spot for scientists. I would stay out there for the full 45 minutes that the divers were in the water because I just loved chatting with, uh, with people and, and getting more of the information across and hearing their perceptions on what they're seeing. So I transitioned fairly soon after to um, work as a volunteer for the visitor education. So just teaching visitors, bring animals out to get them to, to see them up close and personal, doing presentations. And what I found fascinating was that, yeah, I always thought that I did not know enough. My boss, when I started volunteering, she did not have a fisheries background. She did not have a biology background around her. She had a degree in linguistics. And she was the best educator I've ever encountered. She knew more about the about marine science than most people I worked with in college. And I learned more in six months volunteering at the aquarium than I honestly did in about some things after six years of, of college and grad school. And certainly that formal education has given me a lot more to, to lean on when I go into deep conversations. But there was a, a ton of learning there. And when I got done with my master's, I needed a, a job and I landed a nearly full-time gig as a jelly wet nurse, raising baby jellyfish. Uh, so the New England Aquarium is one of the biggest producers of jellyfish or jellies in the country and would sell them. We would use them for display in the aquarium. We would, some species, moon jellies, we might use for feed to other jellies. And uh, we also would sell them to other aquariums and restaurants and casinos because nothing makes you want to spend money more than the hypnotic effect of a jelly just pulsing behind you. I have heard you. this, yeah. It's crazy. That always gets me going. I yeah, really exactly. spend the big big bucks when there's jellies around. Yeah. So do jellyfish have any intelligence? That is a darn good question. And I always would say they know a heck of a lot more about how to be a jelly than I do. And so they are super smart on, in what they need to be smart about. They don't have a brain as we know it they have kind of a neural net and it's, it's kind of in effect a precursor to a brain they, they don't have many parts to them but they also have one of the most fascinating life cycles where the jellies that we know of we call them medusas they're the adult jellies that, that pulse through the water and when they reproduce they'll send out their eggs and sperm in the water for most species and hope for the best and as those eggs get fertilized and develop, they eventually settle down and turn into a polyp, which if you think of a palm tree with its palms pointed straight up, so it's rooted to the bottom, it has this, you know, these palm tree fronds sticking straight up, and it just sits there. And that's and then it's going to start creating euphiry, which is baby jellies. That palm tree, that polyp, will never turn into the jelly that we know and love. And the jellies that we see were never a polyp. And so there are two completely different life forms that are the same species that are reliant upon one another. And polyps can also reproduce by just kind of branching off and kind of like plants in your garden. Some plants will kind of divide and, and recreate that way. So that was kind of my first introduction to aquaculture. How do you deal with raising an animal that is not adapted to live in an aquarium setting? They are very, very fragile. One of the big issues we would run into with the tanks in a jellyfish tank is that if you have polyps on the side 
after some point they turn in, they, they can go into senescence. They can go into effectively hibernation and they just kind of go inside of a cyst. And that cyst can be really, really, really rough. And so if a jelly, an adult jelly swam by that and rubbed against it, it could be torn apart. Oh. So we don't like that. So we would have, we had to have specially made tanks that were super smooth, had no corners because jellies, if they go into a corner, they don't know to turn around. I will say that said, I've seen some studies showing that jellies will gravitate towards food. So while they mostly are just don't seem to be having much rhyme or reason of where they're swimming, they do seem to have, they might have some directionality is just very, very slow and haphazard. Well, that really sounds like some Ridley Scott kind of stories right there. So after that, you ended up becoming, what, head of education or? Um, really what I would do after that, I, um, I got into our summer camps and I became a camp counselor and shortly thereafter also became a program educator where I would go out to schools, bring animals to schools, do presentations there. And I then started coordinating and eventually directing our summer camp and marine science courses for high schoolers. So we, we did programs for kids from fourth grade through 10th grade through 11th grade, really. And then also incorporated a large number of junior counselors who were 10th through 12th grade to serve as counselors. And we would have some lead instructors who were in college or just short, uh, just out of college usually. And so we would have 25 or so staff every summer that we would bring on and, and get up to snuff in terms of New England aquarium knowledge, local marine science knowledge, and kid wrangling knowledge. Yeah, I did that for 14 years or so, and it was awesome. I think the pieces I, I really loved was I saw kids change their lives in a week, where they would come to, to us for one week, and it was in a, an intense camp. We would be there from nine to five, eight to five, and we would have some overnight experiences. But kids would come back the next year and reflect fondly about what they did the previous year. I honestly saw a sea change. Um, we managed to have a lot of kids coming on scholarship. It was an expensive camp, so we had fairly affluent kids, uh, as well as youth who just did not have many opportunities. And having them work and learn side by side, I, I saw both cohorts learning so much more than they would otherwise. Well, considering that you did so much of this and you were around for such a long time, was there a noticeable amount of people that got into the marine sciences after these programs or how did that work? Yeah, we, you know, you know our, our shtick was that we, we didn't need all of these, these youth to become marine scientists, but we did, whether they become marine scientists or fishermen or politicians or garbage men or any of the sort, any part of society, we just needed them to care about the ocean, to know that it's there, to know that we have an impact on it and there are opportunities that it can afford. And uh, so, yes, I had a over 14 years, probably somewhere on the order of four or 5,000 kids came through the, the programs. And I know that a couple hundred at least have, have pursued careers directly down this route. Others will reference it. Um, I'm not in touch with all of them uh, or many of them, which is always a sadness. Some of that growth that I saw was also just not in marine science, but just life. If there are any parents out there who are wondering, do I need it? Should I send my kid away for a week of camp or a summer of camp? I would always look for the, the background of that program, make sure it's a good program. But honestly, the growth I saw in people as humans was tremendous. So you do the New England Aquarium for you know, oh, yeah. so your I term of service. Then what happens? A couple of things I wanted to pull out from that experience too was while doing that, we, we worked with other programs to do citizen science projects so that we, we got youth learning how to do science in a way that we actually had data that was collected by fifth graders who is the, that was then used by scientists. That was quality enough that could be used by scientists across the globe. We also looked into how do you communicate really tough conversations like climate change. So I did not run that, but there was a group called National Network for Ocean and Climate Change Interpretation, or NOCI, and they were instrumental in, in getting a ton of aquariums and zoos across the country to really look at how do we communicate climate change so people understand the, the reality of it, but how do you do it effectively? Because so much of that communication is done poorly and using scare tactics, and that's never going to work it's really more a matter of finding where we have shared values, which we all have some shared values. At the end of my tenure there, uh, COVID hit, 
And in the end, they eliminated their entire education department. There is a visitor education department and an education department. And they eliminated all the programs that had youth coming for long periods of time or any of our outreach programs and teacher resource operations and community service. So really the, the outreach into the communities was truncated. And so my position was eliminated. And oh I, my God, you know, that must have been, how did that make you feel at this point? We, obviously oh, the story was, keeps going, so you know, but. It was so fun. Um, honestly, I had a five month old at the time, six month old at the time. And I ended up finding a job you know, I kept, I was applying all the time, but I finally got a job the week my unemployment ran out. And if I had known that, I would have had the time of my life. And as it was, I still, you know, I got to bond with my son so much more because I, I was home all the time and we did tons of hikes and, and just lots of experiences. So silver lining to all that. Uh, and then I found my way to be a, a middle school math teacher for a short stint. I, through my connections, somebody, there was a school that had struggled to find a math teacher and had gone through several in a couple of years. And the one that they had needed to leave after the first week of school. So I was brought on and I taught math for a semester. And that's not my forte. I had some fun with it, but it was all Zoom and it was, I'm not a trained educator. I'm not a trained formal educator. It was an experience. But then I got offered a gig at uh, MITC grant to focus on aquaculture and yeah, quite a shift, huh? <laughs> it was a bit of a shift and it, but you know, at the beginning, I mentioned one of my big pieces is outreach. How do I engage different groups? And I'm hoping that everyone listening knows this, but school teachers have the hardest job trying to draw out interest from a group of middle schoolers is a pretty good university. Uh, you learn a lot and uh, there is no harsher audience, but also I will also say is there's no audience that that gives more rewards because when you do get some growth there, it, it can swell your heart. So I try, I've tried to use that kind of build off of that momentum going into Sea Grant. And like I said, I'm really focusing on workforce development. The oil spill training is a little bit of a different realm, but it, but we're still trying to bring together very different minded thoughts into one sphere. And one piece I didn't get to mention was, well, I didn't know that that oil spill was, um, work is, is with the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. And while we are incorporating aquaculture knowledge and, and priorities into an oil spill response, we also need to incorporate the tribal priorities and indigenous knowledge and provide that extra perspective for the Coast Guard and other res first responders to oil spill who are trying to walk a pretty tough balancing act of, of which resources are of top priority. So making sure that those community conversations are brought together is, is really key. But that transition to Sea Grant, was, I, I will say it's been an interesting one. There's MIT did not have a position before me that uh, was focused entirely on aquaculture, but we are seeing a tremendous growth in the industry. We all know that there's a lot of people in this world and finding food is not an easy task to get, find enough food for everyone. And really aquaculture is one of the only fields of food production that is that can grow, that is really growing well. Wild capture fishery has kind of plateaued in terms of how much mass we can get out of the ocean. While Meanwhile, aquaculture continues to grow well. So we want to make sure that we get in on the economic opportunity of that, the societal opportunity of that, but also do that in a sustainable way so that we don't screw ourselves over down the road. Ahoy investors! Are you on the lookout for a unique opportunity to invest in a thriving industry? Set your sights on ShipShape, the innovative platform connecting boat and yacht owners with top-notch marine service providers. Our team is committed to revolutionizing the marine repair and refit market in North America. But we can't sail these seas alone. With your support, we can enhance our platform and create a significant impact in the industry. Don't let this exciting investment opportunity drift away. Contact us today to learn more about joining our voyage. Reach out to us at info at shipshape.pro. Danny, I think my um, question on this would be, when you look to the future in terms of all of this, are you inherently optimistic or inherently pessimistic when you factor in the yeah. kind of 
contrast between the people who don't want to engage and also factor in that it can be a fairly bleak picture. But also what you were just saying yeah. about the fact that aquaculture does have this room for growth within it. Is your perspective optimistic, pessimistic, somewhere in the middle? It's in the middle. I think yeah. I am fully aware that there are a lot of headwinds that we, we need to fight against. Some of them can just be diverted into progress. Uh, if Such as, what would you say that those headwinds are? You mean just for the environment, for the ocean in general, or for aquaculture specifically? Kind of both. The inter- yeah. You know, how they intersect. What are the big challenges? I think the, the biggest challenge I see is the silos that we operate in. In every w- part of my career, in every circle I work with, the connections between groups are often tenuous. Mm. And I often think back on uh, one of my professors in undergrad was reflecting on the cod fishery collapse here in, in New England or in the Northeast. You know, the way he put it was, yes, the fish were overfished. Yes, we scientists didn't know all of what we thought we knew. But honestly, one of the biggest reasons it collapsed was scientists wouldn't listen to the fishermen and the fishermen wouldn't listen to the scientists. And that has really stuck with me. So when we can get these groups who see themselves at odds with one another to recognize that they have some shared values and needs and to start to build that trust, I do see optimism there. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I see programs like Sea Grant as the lever that can really facilitate that because Sea Grant is to be a non-advocate. We are to provide information. We're to provide a forum, but we should not be saying that person's right and that person's wrong. It's more of how do we get to be, this is a little naive way to say it, but into a kumbaya moment. And and really that's what we need. Yeah, I do think that we have some pretty big headwinds. Like you, you're asking what those were. And the silos are a big one. I, I think there's also the lack of urgency for some groups is always a challenge when we're talking about climate change, where so many people are so caught up with still whether or not it's happening, which it is. It is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry if that's don't ever allowed to say that, Meryl. <laughs> but it is. <laughs> it, it is. And it's. But the kicker is that the ramifications are profound and we just need to figure out a way to deal with it. And one of the examples that I might have is European green crabs are an invasive species in this area and through much of the world. And they have wreaked havoc on a lot of fisheries and a lot of ecosystems. And they've been around for a long time, but their range seems to be expanding and, and getting more impactful in the last couple of decades. And there has been some recent pushes to look at, yeah, it sucks that they're here, but let's use them. Let's use them to as bait for, for fisheries to reduce the amount of other types of species we need to catch to serve as bait so that we reduce our impact on other parts of the ecosystem. Let's look at ways to incorporate them into People have made green crabs into whiskey. It tastes like a tide pool, but in a good way. I did try it. It, it surprised me, but it was good. Yeah. People have are starting to use green crabs for a lot of good dishes and looking at using them for fertilizer. And so there's so many different op- opportunities there that one of the angles that Sea Grant can serve is to look at how do we get the right stakeholders together to talk about what those opportunities may be, to explore what those are. And if there's any technology that we need to develop, perhaps we could get some engineers to start working towards that in the academic world that we then extend out to the commercial world that they can run with and do all the amazing things that the commercial world can do. Because what I would say is it strikes me that if we spend all our time on, quite frankly, useless debates about whether something is happening or not happening, we're wasting a lot of time and resources that could be better spent, you know, working with you and your organisation and other organisations on how to actually, you know, harness these things and, and turn it into something that's useful rather than wasting air on whether we think something that's clearly happening is happening. And my other, my other question to you, Danny, would be what you've described there is a lot of innovation and a lot of thinking outside the box in terms of people's eating habits you know when we're thinking about the future and fisheries and all the rest of it does this have implications on how we should all be thinking about how we actually feed ourselves specific foods we should be avoiding i'm not saying you have to give a comprehensive list but do you think there's a bit of a mindset shift that's necessitated by this yeah and it's and this is a very sensitive issue. Um, well, I'm glad I raised it then. 
<laughs> there are um, <laughs> some groups that will put out lists of what is good and bad to eat. And there are a lot of discussions and a lot of debates about the accuracy of those lists. You can have a lot of political sway impacting those lists. And many of them are trying to come from the right place. But there's honest debate about whether or not they reflect the truth. The yeah. one thing that people can can in general are agreeing with is shellfish are one of the most sustainable, if not the most sustainable way to get protein. I do not know of a of another protein source, be it um, plant or animal, that is more sustainable. That does not require that when we grow shellfish in the near shore, we don't put any any fresh water or inputs into it. We don't have any fertilizer inputs into it. We don't we don't feed it anything when it's out there. It just eats what's in the water. So the only real environmental impacts are going to be, well, they provide habitat for a lot of other species when you have a farm out there. There are, you know, you have some operations that will have a number of boats that have to go out and tend to the farm, but that's a relatively small footprint. So looking at shellfish as a really strong opportunity, and when I say shellfish, I'm really saying oysters, clams, and that sort of shellfish. Lobsters are in a different realm, and lobsters are, are a spot where there is a very healthy debate right now. There is a very strong debate. I think some may argue it's not a healthy um, debate, but there's a very strong debate as to the net benefit, net costs of species like lobster. When we look at fish, so salmon, bass, that sort of thing, I think a big part of it is looking at who is growing it and how responsible they are at growing those species. Are they taking steps to minimize their impact on the world around them? Um, what is one of the big issues with fin fish is they take a lot of inputs to get a relatively smaller output. You have to feed them a lot of fish to get a lot of fish out. So you have to source that fish or that feed from somewhere that can either be heavy on the ecosystem or, or heavy on resources uh, and energy. You also have a, a waste issue where fin fish poop a lot. And that poop is can cause, if there's concentrated in one spot, it can cause problems. There are great solutions to that. Something called integrated multi-trophic aquaculture, where you are growing different trophic levels or different layers of the food web or the food chain. If you think of one trophic level would be the primary producers like plants, um, the things yeah. that that first layer. The next being the things that eat plants, the next being the predators, and there's tons of layers there. If you can grow different trophic levels, you can minimize, if not completely elim eliminate, that negative impact on the environment. Uh, so some fish farms will also be growing seaweed and mussels around them or use sea cucumbers below to deal with any of the waste that the fin fish um, produce. They also can be products that you can sell. So it can, it can be a good use, space use uh, detail. Because I think a lot of people listening to this would assume, and I came into this as kind of with the assumption, Danny, that to, to be the most sustainable, you would need to adopt what they call, obviously, a plant-based lifestyle. I mean, I'm not <laughs> vegan or vegetarian myself, so this was just my assumption. But you hear a lot of talk that the you know the way that we're all going to have to survive on this planet is to adopt a plant-based lifestyle. So what you're saying is really fascinating, a really fascinating different perspective on how shellfish can actually be, you know, a really sustainable option as, as long, I guess, as long as you look into the sort of production methods and sourcing and all the rest of it. And I will say there is, and my big argument when we discuss the plant-based approach, and this is going to probably cause a little bit of pushback from somewhere, but is freshwater is the most precious resource we have. And many of the vegetable products we have out there use far more water than those areas can sustainably provide. And that has a massive impact on the environment. So yes, climate change is a big issue. There are other impacts on the environment that we, we cannot ignore. And when you're talking about fresh water, there's all usage, there's also a lot of human rights issues that are associated with who gets what water. So we're adapted to be omnivores. I kind of like to lean into nature. I feel like nature got it, had to figure, figure it out before we went along and tried to screw things up. Yeah. And so I really tend to lean towards what role were we adapted for? And let's play into that. I will say for most consumers, it is really hard to go through and say, where is that fish from or, or any of those sorts of questions. But I will say it has an impact. If you go to your grocer and just say, hey, who caught that? Or where is that from? Just 
And sometimes they'll respond with, well, why do you care? And that could be really useful. One of my favorite moments was in the span of a week, I went to, I won't name names for the negative experience. I went to a very fancy restaurant in Boston and wanted to order, forget which kind of fish it was. This was probably 12 years ago, but I know that that fish can be caught sustainably if it's caught locally, but if it's imported, it's usually not well sourced. So I asked the waiter, like, do you know where this was caught or how this was caught? And, and again, this is a really fancy restaurant. And his response was, no one here cares. Why do you even yeah. need to know? That? Like, look at this it's weirdo. Like, Who cares about yeah. this fish? <laughs> and the kicker was a week later, I went to Friendly's. My friend wanted to order a shrimp salad. So I challenged her to ask and we asked and the waiter was like, I don't know where the shrimp are from. Hold on. I'll be right back. She went, went back. She came back 10 minutes later. She's like, so I asked the chef. He didn't know. So he called the owner and he didn't know. So he called his source and she told him it's from Peru. Isn't that crazy? And is that good? And we're like, no, that's not great. But the fact that you put that much effort into it and you, you got it, you just got those people thinking about the fact that their consumers actually care about this. Mm. That could pay dividends. And wow. I know that some companies have changed their practices to highlight that this is where this fish is from because you will get more patronage if you are transparent about that sort of thing. When we talk about aquaculture and frankly, everything in marine for the most part, there's like a level of it's new, right? Kind of like a new industry. And there's things that haven't really been established yet. Now, on a larger kind of comparison of aquaculture versus agriculture, what are some of the key differences that are going on? Obviously, I like to think agriculture has just had way more time to develop a lot of these practices. You know, what else is different about it? Well, the really, it's getting to a point where there's not a ton of difference. Uh, there's so much more agriculture that's happening in high-tech settings, the vertical crops that became such a rage. With aquaculture, there's something called a RAS system or recirculating aquaculture system. And that can operate on land and can utilize a fair bit of fresh water. Sometimes it can be done really well and really sustainably. Those kind of operations have some parallels with agriculture in terms of their impacts on the, on the world around them. But I will say when you go and are growing oysters in a, in a series of cages, there's not a ton of difference between that and growing a bunch of corn, except when agriculture grows that corn in a manner that does not preclude other animals or other parts of the ecosystem to survive in that space. So one of the big differences with between much of agriculture and most of aquaculture in this state would be that there is fertilizer used in agriculture that is not allowed in aquaculture. And that fertilizer has a lot of impacts on a, many different levels. You can avoid that. You can reduce the need for that if you grow in a effectively doing multi-trophic agriculture. Never would have connected those dots, but <laughs> yeah, it makes a whole lot of sense. And um, we had done an interview a while back of with Jordy St. John's. He owns Merritt Island Oysters and some main main oyster association or something to that effect and obviously we brought up the workforce question and clearly you're a good person to ask this to i mean what are the issues going on with workforce development within let's say the aquaculture generally in the boating yeah. industry a lot of people will say it's just it's not a very great job you don't get paid a whole that much and there's not a lot of opportunities but in the same sense, the fact that your job exists shows how much opportunities there are. So let's talk on that. Yeah, I believe it's New Hampshire Sea Grant actually put out some publication. I only heard about this the other day, so I haven't looked it up yet. But on the array of careers you can find with training somewhat similar to mine or interests somewhat similar to mine. But for the workforce development challenge around here, a big part of it is because the, the lion's share of aquaculture in Massachusetts happens along the coast in very affluent communities, there is a tendency that those farms can find high school workers to work for a summer or two. And this is not a complete blanket statement, but there tends to be a 
an attitude from those families that their youth are probably not going to work a blue collar job once they get out of high school. So it is difficult for farmers to maintain that workforce after a couple of years. So we don't really have that next generation of farm owners rising up through the ranks. So what I see as an opportunity is working with communities who are looking for blue collar work. You know, that is a Frankly, I love working out on the farm. It's I'm not in a, at a desk job during that time. I'm getting to be creative. Um, I will say aquacultures are some of the most creative, ingenious people I, I've met. They come up with solutions to all sorts of challenges throughout the day. So you get a ton of opportunity to flex your brain as you work through all of that. So I want to find people who recognize a hard day's work is still a good day of work. Some growers will observe that they're often are youth who had a lot of privilege who will come out to the farm and they really balk at the amount of work that's required to work on a farm. Mm. And I saw that at the aquarium where in general, my best instructors were the junior counselors who were one of seven kids and the breadwinner for the family. They worked there, took us off and they were responsible as can be. That said, I also encountered a a number of uh, very affluent kids who had a tremendous work ethic. But I would say that on average, the work ethic was better from those who recognized that this was an opportunity that they were lucky to have. So I'm looking a program that Whistle C Grant and I are currently getting underway very soon will be to try to bring in people from coastal adjacent communities who don't even know that aquaculture exists particularly communities that eat a lot of seafood, but may not engage in our local seafood production and try to provide the training so that they can come onto a farm. They cycle through the different parts of aquaculture. So there's not just growers, but there's producer processors and distributors and a whole slew of careers that are are supported by aquaculture. And so cycle them through an array of those kind of opportunities and then get them a one-year paid internship where they can really cut their teeth. And during that time, provide those wraparound services that preclude them from being able to engage in this industry. So specifically housing, it's expensive to be living near the coast. And so we're, we're looking to find partners who will help house young adults who will be working in a program like this that we could we can house them for relatively cheap but still valid housing that's we don't want them to live in squalor and we'd be providing transportation support to get them from those coastal adjacent communities and part of the goal here would be while we can bring in workers from these coastal adjacent communities we may also expose those communities to our local aquaculture industry as a seafood source one of the big things that i always think about is i had 16 year olds who came to work for me at the aquarium in Boston, who grew up in Dorchester and they were one mile as a crow flies, they were one mile from the ocean. They had never seen ocean water until they came to the aquarium for the interview. And that frankly blew my mind. When I encountered that, it helped to shatter my understanding of what privilege was. And once you expose them to this opportunity and provided them some of the basic self-confidence that they can operate around the water and, and survive, they well, became huge advocates, and that was that was that's a huge opportunity. Well, as you had mentioned earlier about the marine industry's issue with being siloed, I mean, I was sitting here thinking, I haven't heard this before. You know, why isn't this in the boating industry or the super yacht industry? Because obviously, there's a massive workforce problem, and a lot of the problems are the same thing: lack of awareness of the marine industry to begin with. Not a lot of exposure. The coastal towns are expensive, you know. So if you got any documents, you know, you should send them our way. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Perfect. it was uh, certainly great to have you on the show. And um, as we kind of close to an end, you want to give us maybe last top lessons that you've learned along the way and where to find you. Yeah. Yeah. My main lesson has been don't take myself too seriously. My main goal is to be able to communicate with people effectively. And I learned quickly that, especially with kids, I act like a big buffoon, but with a level of respectability and I can get a lot out of them and I can, I can reach them well. And I found that with most adults, that's the case too. I don't take myself too seriously while keeping my eye on things that I'm passionate and really truly care about. 
and keeping an eye on who's going to be impacted by those actions that I'm taking um, has allowed me to just kind of feel a little, feel good about how I'm using myself in my career. Um, and where to find me? I am based out of Cambridge, MIT, at the Sea Grant office there. I am, however, usually somewhere else uh, and often um, going out to farms. My realm is all of Massachusetts. Uh, the, mo- the majority of aquaculture in Massachusetts is on Cape Cod and, and somewhat on the South Shore. We're looking to find other opportunities that would be palatable for other communities um, and provide the economic value that aquaculture can bring. Um, Danny, just mm-hmm. because you said you don't like to take yourself too seriously, if you were a fish, what would you be? Oh, if I were a fish, honestly, I think the um, maybe just because I saw these yesterday <laughs> i am in love with lumpfish lumpfish uh, lumpfish okay. they are the cutest damn fish you'll ever see right uh, i'm googling them good they are they're a puppy dog with fins oh, and they, they are both adorable and extremely useful in aquaculture they have been found to be one of the better ways to deal with parasites in fish that are grown in aquaculture because you can imagine when you have a whole bunch of animals in one certain spot it might concentrate some diseases or or parasites and that's the case with land-based agriculture as well as the ocean you bring a lot of animals together you bring a lot of humans together it's a recipe for sharing diseases and things like that so finding techniques to minimize that is useful and the uh, uh, lump fish will eat sea lice off of salmon so i love that they will be useful and i also love that they've evolved their i think it's the pelvic fins have evolved to be underneath their body and serve as a suction cup and they can suck onto something and hold on tight and just go along for a ride they're colorful they're useful they're adorable they're multi-purpose we can see why you chose that fish danny (laughs) (laughs) oh it's fun well great having you on the show Uh, Thank you so much for having me. Check back every Tuesday for our latest episode. And be sure to like, share and subscribe to ShipShape.pro.